Dolce decorum est pro patri mori. It is good and honourable to die in battle. Or so they say. Welcome to this week's edition of Wiggins Talks Films. This week I'm talking about war. First of all then, The Five Bloods is a Vietnam War movie set in the modern day. It tells the story of five black men fighting the war in Vietnam during the 60s, running parallel with a treasure of the Sierra Madre style quest for gold in the present day. One of the men was killed, we don't know how and therein lies the mystery, but is replaced by one of the other sons to make up the constant five. It's interesting to note that in the flashbacks, the young versions of the actors are all played by their older counterparts, something that greatly adds to the viewer's experience. There's no confusion about who's who for one. There's also a distinct difference between the age of their fallen comrade, played by Chadwick Boseman, and the rest of the team, which makes for good poignancy. The performances are all good, but Delroy Lindo, a collaborator of Spike Lee's from back in the Malcolm X days, Crooklyn eras, is particularly noteworthy, and Lindo takes great relish in sinking his teeth into the Trump-loving veteran suffering from PTSD. It's a shame the running length is a bit much. It seems there is a great two-hour movie with an extra half hour stuck on. There's also a few scenes that try maybe too hard to tie the film into current affairs that don't seem overly relevant to the plot. Set during World War II, Humphrey Bogart plays Rick, the owner of Rick's Café American in Casablanca, Morocco. He's on the run from the memories of Paris and a woman he left there. It's completely brilliant. Emotionally and story-wise, it can't be faulted. The supporting cast are amazing. Ingrid Bergman beautifully portrays Ilsa with a turmoil between Bogart and Paul Henreid. Claude Rains injects a touch of the comic. And Conrad Veet, remember him from The Clown Who Laughs a few vlogs ago? is deliciously evil. He hasn't been rivalled as a loathable Nazi villain until Christoph Waltz in Inglorious Bastards. There's not a touch wrong, and the gripping finale has the power to elicit tears even 78 years later. Beautiful. Steven Spielberg directed Saving Private Ryan to international acclaim. The dynamite pairing of Spielberg behind the camera and Tom Hanks was always going to be a recipe for critics and audiences alike. Hanks plays the leader of a troop of World War II soldiers sent from Normandy to behind enemy lines in order to save Private Ryan from being the last of five brothers killed in the war. It's not just Hanks who shines. The entire squadron is made up of faces that you'll recognise from various films and television shows. There's Eddie from Friends, Brothers McMullen director Edward Burns, Vin Diesel, pre-Fast and Furious fame, Captain Mal Reynolds from Firefly, Ralph from Friends, Literally, there's so many good spots, I don't want to list them all here. Spielberg clearly knew talent when they walked into an audition room. The story is interesting. It's been copied in numerous knockoffs as a tried and tested method for award cinema, such as BAFTA Best Picture winner 1917, which beat out Parasite this year for the award. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, the war scenes are suitably epic here, and the shots are sometimes so quick they create an illusion of confusion almost as if the audience are in the trenches with the troops. A greatly made film and well deserving of the hype it received and still receives. In the classic Buster Keaton movie The General, Keaton plays a train engineer whose one true love is kidnapped, as well as the girl he fancies, during the American Civil War. Its japes are plenty as he boards another train in order to get the titular general back from the pesky Union villains. The comedy is typical Keaton, slapstick. It's a bit overlong, but I laughed out loud a good few times and greatly enjoy Keaton as a performer, particularly when opposed to the more serious in nature hard-hitting war films of the era. Woody Harrelson and Ben Foster star in the buddy comedy mo- Wait, I mean, Woody Harrelson and Ben Foster star in the buddy war movie, The Messenger. They play soldiers tasked with telling family their next of kins that their loved ones have been killed in the line of duty. Harrelson plays the grizzled ex-alcoholic that proceeds to tell new boy Foster of the golden rules in how they can serve. Both of them break every rule at least once, but it's not just the drama that steals the spotlight. Their relationship with one another, and with those who don't understand the atrocities of war, steal every scene. Not only are the two leads excellent, but there's also outstanding and emotion-filled performances from Steve Buscemi and Samantha Morton to look forward to. I dislike the phrase, but this is truly a hidden gem. All Quiet on the Western Front is a different kind of war film. It's slower in pace than the more recent output of the genre, and for that reason, I don't think it's as effective as a film than the source novel by Eric Maria Romarque. It does contain, extraordinary for the time, amounts of gore and a shocking act of violence, 
but is a trifle over long and maybe a wee bit twee. The most effective parts are when the lead character returns home to visit his family for a short time on leave. He can't wait to get back to the battlefront, but never seems to fit in there either. It's truly a shocking reality of the sheer boredom and constant on-edgeness of war, and probably one of the most realistic portrayals of how many soldiers would have felt in the First World War. The documentary Ne Passeran shows Scottish factory workers uniting against an unjust coup in Chile in the 70s. When the Chilean military killed the democratically elected president, a spate of marchers stand in solidarity against the uprising. In order to fight back against the Pinochet dictatorship, workers in the Rolls-Royce factory 30 minutes outside Glasgow blacklist the engine parts belonging to Pinochet's air force. The film examines it through the lens of the Scottish workers and asks them what questions they have, particularly what happened to the machine parts after they disappear under mysterious circumstances one night in 1978. The documentary is a longer version of a short doc from 2013 and you'll find yourself trying to spot which bits were shot on which filming session. There's some very emotional scenes here which definitely add to the style of the documentary and edges the points it's received. A good watch about a subject I had little to no knowledge of it wears its union fanness on its sleeve. War does not determine who's right, it determines who's left. I'm sure there's other phrases that I can remember from Call of Duty in regards to war. But for now, I'll just say thanks for watching and see you next week. Maybe.